Friday afternoon, downtown Honolulu, folks. Ted Ralston here, where the drone leads our uh, weekly show where we talk about things that are happening in a world of unmanned air systems or drones, if you will. A couple of frequent flyers on the show uh, with us this time. Mike Elliott to my left. Mike, thanks for coming on going? again. Okay. Thanks again, Ted. Appreciate Do your it. Shout outs at the right time here to all the people who've been supporting Can us. Do. And then a lot of great people, yeah. Far away in the uh, Think Tech Hawaii, Washington, D.C. studio uh, is Chuck Devaney, one of our. Uh, uh, earlier members on this show and a long time uh, frequent uh, contributor to the show. Chuck, uh, welcome aboard again. Thanks, Ted. Thanks and, uh, for having me on the show. We were noticing that you look quite different than in your prior uh, uh, initiate, in, in, instantiation here. You've cleaned up. You're no longer the beach scruff look. You're look the Washington, D.C. streamlined look now. So I guess it's had, had an effect on you, huh, moving to D.C.? Yeah, um, and I actually have to wear a suit and tie from time to time. A suit and tie. Yeah. Okay, you have one of those Velcro on ties, or you actually have to tie it with the knot and all? No, it's, I've got a knot. I went on YouTube and figured out how to do that. <laughs> all right, well, that's good. Well, Chuck, it's uh, great hearing you and uh, great seeing you. It's go also good to know that, uh, as you know, Mike is here, which means that the snowstorm that's affected you did not affect Mililani, at least not as much as it affected what's taking place in no, D.C. We're, we're fine here. Okay, <laughs> there you are. So, Chuck, we're short sleeves and 80 degrees outside. Uh, and uh, again, thanks for taking your time. Too bad Jim Blanchard couldn't join us. Uh, I guess the snow has affected him to the point. Yeah, that... our plan initially was to do it at the academy, but um, when the snow started falling, everybody, you know, the show, the, the the whole town shuts down for the most part. Schools get let out early, so everybody goes home and and uh, and uh, bundles up and, and stays in. And that's good because DC drivers really aren't used to driving in the snow. It doesn't snow that much there, and so uh, getting inside where drivers aren't is probably a good idea. Yeah, it's uh, just like here in Hawaii with the rain. You know, it's about the equivalent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Chuck, uh, I think we've had Mike on uh, since we had you on. Let's uh, ask you to tell you tell us a little bit about your move to DC and the UAV Academy and what's going on there. Um, absolutely, Ted. So. Um, uh, the first of the year, I, I, I moved over to the D.C. area. I'm actually, uh, my title is the Director of Information Science at the, uh, at the Academy. We do a lot of uh, curriculum building, so we basically train trainers. We train professionals to be trainers. We also train um, teachers and professors to be trainers, and uh, we also help them write their curriculum. So that's kind of a little bit of the basis for of, of of the model of the of the academy. So a lot of what I've been doing is writing modules that uh, can be placed into eboard and be used by educators. Um, also, I've got four builds on my on my uh, on my bench. I've got a, a heavy lift quad prototype that uh, has recently been designed and I'm putting together, and it's in the tuning phase. I've also got three fixed wing aircraft that I'm building for for uh, for training purposes at the academy. So the academy, the building itself is about uh, just under 4,000 square feet. Um, we've got a five acre field right next to the uh, building so we can step right outside and fly. Um, we've got a, uh, a total two mobile command and control centers uh, fitted with 60 inch LCD screens inside, um, full comms, we uh, have multi-channel comms. We are fully capable of supporting any search and rescue um, effort that might you know, come across the board. So we, we have that. We also do call outs for the ABC network. Um, whenever they need us, we'll go and provide drone footage of their correspondent and uh, whatever application they're looking for. Chuck, that, that sounds fantastic. The drone life's been good to you, and you keep being good for it. That's pretty cool. And what I'm thinking of is Chuck's talking about that, Mike, is exactly what you're doing on Lanai. Yeah, Talk so a little bit about Maybe uh, we can we tie these a, two uh, together somehow. Yeah, we had an amazing uh, uh, phone conference the other day with uh, the folks in the Drone Nationals, uh, AUVSI, uh, state STEM coordinators, um, just exactly what you're talking about is building out these uh, curriculum and modules and this introduction of uh, drone technology into the into schools and 
basically what it is, like we, we keep saying again and again, is that uh, math, math and science matter, but you have to apply them. And this type of uh, technology actually gives uh, kids the ability to apply those skill sets that they learn in math and science and uh, into a practical application. And the best thing about it is they're having fun and they don't realize they're learning. So we see that as a huge plus. And uh, maybe we can uh, discuss some things in here in the near future for what we're trying to do here back in Hawaii. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the update us on what's taking place on Lanai itself with the facility you've got. And so uh, we're in uh, right now in final uh, discussions with securing a facility over there to be able to have a uh, uh, build and repair facility. Uh, it will be heavily integrated within uh, some of the STEM uh, work that's going to be going on there initially on Lanai. Uh, you know, we're, we're just looking to expand that out here throughout the state and just make this a regular part of uh, STEM and STEAM programs that are going to be uh, rolling out here uh, in the new, this year and, and obviously hopefully we can get to all the islands, all schools within maybe, a, uh, maybe by the end of next. So Chuck, we have an obvious uh, similar mindset in, in both locations, uh, 6,000 miles apart, and uh, anything we can do to generate in, uh, information sharing and idea sharing would be great. Chuck will be back here sometime, what, April, Chuck? Yeah, that's kind of the plan. As of now, we're going to try to get back over there in April and uh, um, have to pay a visit to everybody to see how things are going. Hey, just just as a matter of reference, we do have the uh, U.S. District Court. Hawaii is having its uh, annual conference April 7th and 8th, and the 8th is going to be a discussion from the legal perspective about UAVs, UAV business and such. So maybe that's the time period you want to be here yeah. and uh, have that interaction. But we can get, uh, get Chuck over to Lanai. You know, yeah. Lanai sounds like what Chuck's got. Chuck's got five acres right outside. You've got 500 acres right outside. Yeah. Right? So Lanai is like a giant test area for you It is, and, and hopefully that will be the case uh, here at some point. Um, and, you know, that, that discussion on legal aspects and what uh, local communities and states can and cannot do in, in UAS regulation I think is critical. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen some of the stories, too, where uh, local communities try to enact their own rules, uh, but they're not allowed to. The FAA... You know, it's FAA uh, airspace management issues, and uh, it, it's going to cause a lot of confusion if you don't have uh, consistent rule sets across the board, uh, municipalities, cities, state, and, uh, you know, if the federal government is the entity, then the federal government is the entity. So looking ahead to 2016, whether it's Hawaii or Washington, D.C. or anywhere in the middle, it's going to be a very complicated year, isn't it, as these various rules and interpretations roll up, and they're probably not time synced from one part of the country to the other. And there's going to be the evolution of some kind of a business model that works, or multiple business models that work. There's going to be a very difficult time for people out there, either potential customers or people who want to get into the business, to really figure out what the, what the status is, what the truth is at any one time. That's true. And, uh, Chuck, I mean, you've probably seen this, too. I mean, we've been very successful in, uh, you know, our commercial UAS operations and stuff, and people don't even know that we're out there. Uh, doing this. We just, you know, we follow all the procedures, we do everything we need to do, and, uh, you know, we get out, we shoot professionally, uh, we provide it to the client, and we're off, you know, to another job another day. So, um, you know, once it becomes commonplace, I think people will uh, not be as concerned or worried about it, and they realize that it's actually providing a useful service and purpose and uh, saving people time, money, and maybe not putting lives at risk, too. And, and this is, so what may come out of this is some kind of frame of reference that defines what a, a successful business looks like. I mean, there's the retail aspect of selling things. There's probably a maintenance and repair and, and recovery aspect of, of that. Uh, there's a service aspect that could be independent of the, of the UAVs themselves. Chuck, from your perspective, and of course you're in the curriculum and building part now, we understand, but from your perspective, where do you see the opportunities for a sustainable business to emerge or, or that we should get behind and push? We'll ask Mike the same question. But from your perspective, where you've been flying kites on Sandy Beach with cameras hanging on them five years ago to in D.C., all slicked up and working the beltway, uh, how do you see that all emerging in terms of a business framework? Um, well, obviously, the film industry is going to be a big one. They've already been a driver as, as far as um, uh, the movement of the legality issues and overcoming how to overcome those. Um, so there's going to be a lot of potential there. There already is a lot of potential there. And I think that uh, Mike has, has already been a part of that. I know Tim Lerman has also been a part of that. 
Um, there's also the survey aspect um, in a controlled environment. Um, there's the acquisition side of the survey component, but also what to do with the information, how to get that into interpretable information that can be used and decisions can be made. So um, there's the whole, I guess, geographic information science or remote sensing aspect of it. People seem to really be caught up in the platform um, itself and how to make that better. And then it might be a long time for before people, you know, get away from that. But um, that is driving the industry forward in a, in a way that we're going to see more efficient, longer endurance, safer aircraft. Um, there's a lot of different, I guess, avenues that, that we could go in terms of having a sustainable business plan. Um, one, another one would be education, providing information for educators, um, training programs for professionals. Um, I can go on and on. Well, yeah, what were, you know, I remember, uh, give us you your know, ideas, Mike. Well, you know, when, I, go? when I was in high school um, in Arizona, and stuff, uh, one of the classes I had taken, we had to make a, um, a topographic survey map. We went out and actually surveyed the entire campus. A rather large campus, and we had to come back. And we had to build a topographic map off of that, and got graded off how well we did it and everything. Uh, so you take that into that was obviously you know back in the day, but you take that to today, and if you had kids uh, flying a drone and building a topographic map, a relief map, and had you know certain mission aspects to it, um, it has that same application. You know they they learn the uh, geos, uh, spatial sciences. Uh, they learn, you know, like I said, the technology and the mapping piece, but you're exactly right. It's the post-processing, I think, that is key in uh, the data that you collect. I mean, the platforms are great. It's, it's what do I do with these, you know, gigabytes and terabytes of data that, to make sense to me in a useful format, in a, in a real, in a near real-time format, too. That's, I think, the key. They don't need uh, multi-day, multi-week processing. So what we have to do is find a way to take those uh, centers of value and turn them into businesses that are either standalone or attached to some other business like surveying or construction management or something like that that already uses similar and, and potentially related technologies. You know, the reason I'm asking the question is I deal with a lot of manufacturers um, and uh, pretty much all of them are looking for venture capital or some other form of capital support at the equipment level. That is, the, those who are attempting to make it and on a serial production basis are in, in the hunt for continued funding. And they well, I think you were just up recently with uh, Bird's Eye uh, yeah. Aerobotics. I know uh, one of the guys that works for them now, uh, we've known each other for quite a while and he'd worked on some projects and done something for us in the past, great guy. Um, it, yeah, it is, it really is. It's, I think, you know, the investment piece is people trying to find the right horse to back and where, where's the future can lead. Um, but yeah, they're doing a great job with their Firefly 6. It's been very popular. Uh, we're getting some ourselves to do some work and stuff too. So we can bring one here to the money. table. Next oh, well. time we next time we have you here, Mike, yeah. you come with a bird's eye, right? I'll have it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Firefly. Yeah. But again, I think they're like everybody else is needing that injection of capital funding to get solidified, get centralized, bring people in from all over the country in these virtual operations and turn it into a, a production house. So so that's an inter interesting thing. If you focus just on the platform, it requires some uh, big brother support of some kind in order to move forward. Now, I work with, uh, associated with Instani to a degree, and, um, and beginning to understand what their business model is. It's primarily the razors and blades. They give away the razor, the razor, and sell the blades, and uh, so their basic their equipment goes basically out the door at, at uh, very little markup. But uh, the, the the training requirements that exist by injecting that system into uh, military operations are incredible. So they're called upon. Uh, at least half their company is doing training, so their 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 revenue is on the training side, yeah. inspired by the I, equipment itself. Yeah. I think Chuck might agree too. On the other end of that, um, you know, that's that's one way to make money. But I think training the trainer and having people become self-sufficient to be able to use this technology probably is a little more cost-efficient for uh, cities, oh, for them, counties, for sure. city, yeah. county, state type governments. Uh, that's what that's what they should be doing. Uh, you don't see people who sell firefighting equipment out training the firefighters uh, once a month on the exact same piece of equipment. No, they learn how to use it. They train themselves. Even that, the uh, even the, the train the trainer aspect is the is the fifty percent of the business part. It's yeah. it's expanding so fast. So there's a, there's an example of uh, 
of the product actually generating the training requirement and the training requirement becoming the, uh, the value statement for the customer and also the value statement for the manufacturer. So they found that, that spot. Um, and then that uh, leads to the other question that uh, Chuck and you both brought up, and that is the post-processing, the, the value-added aspects of uh, various kinds of analysis and such. And you know, we have people right down the street here at Ocean who has some really incredible uh, real-time processing uh, feature extraction and such. In fact, it was actually used in a Rose Bowl and a Rose Parade uh, two weeks ago uh, in a pseudo counter drone operation to make sure that nothing was de nothing occurred that could harm those two events. And so they used the feature extraction right there in real time as it would be uh, in the future uh, turned into an onboard system for real time determination. So there's another example of not post processing but real time processing. So anyway, uh, the future is uh, going to be uh, great for those who can figure out what this complex situation is and ride through it. We've got one right here, Mike Elliott in Hawaii, and one on, in the East Coast, Chuck Devaney. And uh, actually, Chuck's from Bogota and Washington, D.C., and Maui, and Waikiki, and Manoa, and Virginia, you, you name it. So Chuck's kind of the, the world man here. Anyway, we'll get back and talk a little bit more about business models after our first break. Sounds good. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel, that's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He asks them these questions and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's questions. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon uh, <laughs> every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world. And there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on Think Tech. Aloha. Aloha. How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts. Gordo the Texar and Andrew the security guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Friday afternoon, folks. One more time here in downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston here. Chuck Devaney in uh, Washington, D.C. or somewhere on the East Coast under the snow. And Mike Elliott sitting here right next to me. Mike, thanks again for coming on. Chuck, Anytime. always a pleasure to have you on. And we were talking. Uh, quite excitedly about where the various aspects of drone business may occur in uh, in the future here. Let's just talk a little bit about what's coming to the larger industry this year that affects how that business might be defined. We have uh, uh, we have FAR 107 potentially hitting the books in in June. middle of the year or something like that. Talking June about. is what I've heard, but who knows? Yep. Yeah. So we've heard June 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. So we have a potential regulation coming forth that's going to uh, be useful to all of us because it finally stabilizes the method of going forward in a formal way and avoids the exemptions and all the okay. other. Yeah, risks. great example. I mean, it's it simplify the rule set for commercial operations. Uh, currently, uh, for a great example, you know, I have to submit an end number form for a real airplane or a helicopter to get an end number for a drone that I use for commercial purposes. They sit there and ask for how many passengers can it carry, <laughs> serial numbers for the motors. I mean, things that NA, NA, NA. And uh, simplify this process. Put it on a website. Have an account for me as a business. Let me just click on what I need to do, update it, and, uh, you know, away we go. And we're good to go. Yeah. You, get, you, get, yeah. you get what you needed by that means. And I same, think Chuck would agree. Same thing I for agree. the pilot training aspect. Uh, yeah. Right now, we have, a, have to have a pilot's license in order to operate the drones under uh, 333. Yeah. But in the future, that will be replaced by a basic aeronautical knowledge. Right, this, so there's a ground school requirement. I, I think you know, Chuck, they've, they've talked about, and, and in talking to people in the FAA, it's like, we don't care that you can fly the drone. We care that you operate safely, you understand the rules, you know how the FAA works, uh, you know, airspace integration, all these things. That's what they care about more than uh, your drone flying ability. Uh, and then the other thing that's going to accompany that rule, once the rule hits, now there has to be compliance to the rule. Compliance methods will be evolved in some way that we haven't quite seen yet. They're going to, from what I understand, they're going to be following the uh, 
uh, Part 21, which is the uh, light sport aircraft orientation, which has a lot of manufacturer involvement as opposed to just FAA involvement. And so there'll be some structured, some TSO, technical service orders, which will be requirements for, uh, for performance. Uh, but they'll also be very general. And you can, I, I believe what I have heard coming is that you can propose a means of safety and that may be okay. It's not something in a TSO given to you as a, as a, as a formula. You can look at different ways to get there. So that's, so. that's all going to be good. So common sense and, uh, you know, the best thing I think, as I said before, the best thing government can do is, is get out of the way uh, of industry. Let industry find its path and then maybe set some bounds in, at some point in the future. Because if Orville, Orville and Wilbur Wright had to follow the current rules and regulations that are on the books for aircraft and aircraft safety, they would have never got off the ground. You know, to a certain extent, uh, what the light sport aircraft did is that. Light, air, light sport aircraft allowed a lot of latitude, and if, as long as industry proceeds successfully and safely and doesn't get in trouble, then the FAA is quite happy with it. Why shouldn't they be? It's and and which, which they have done so far. In fact, it's very similar in another respect as well. The light sport aircraft rules came about, as I understand it, from pressure by uh, aging airline pilots who wanted to keep flying but weren't interested in the general aviation framework, wanted something lighter and, and a little sleeker, and proposed this sort of a self-managed concept called light sport aircraft. And that's kind of what we're doing here in drones. So it's self-managed to a certain extent by industry. I hope so. But there will be some standards. I do believe that RTCA is going to give us standards on the, high, on the, uh, the frequency spectrum that we'll be able to operate in. So we probably will have to get into software-defined radios to make sure we can adapt to whatever band C or whatever it is that comes out as a communication channel that we're going to be granted. And there will be some safety-based TSOs on uh, the function of um, catastrophic capability versus the level of the airspace you want to operate in. And the higher the level of airspace and the more catastrophic, the more more Safe intense, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. which and, makes uh, sense. So it's all, it's all and sensible Ted, I, and I good. I think you'd agree, too. You know, the, uh, that air, national airspace integration piece, uh, you know, the ADSB, I mean, having drone awareness and aircraft awareness on both ends, you know, just enhances overall safety. And those, those systems are coming here in the very near future, too. But that looks, you know, I think what we just defined is a, is a big piece of the potential future business. And that's a well-structured educational program wrapped around FAR 107 and the things you need to know uh, in a, from a, taking an aviator's mindset and, and applying it to the world of the drones. So right there is a piece of business that has no end because uh, everybody's going to need it. Everybody's going to need to have a certificate of some kind after having been passed through that. And I'll bet those courses don't exist yet. So uh, people should be putting them together, thinking about it real hard. Um, yeah, and I have somebody who's actually working on something. So uh, those are something else, huh? Yeah, and Did you get revealed here at the table sometime in the future. Probably. All right. Uh, and then trying when to pair, be? pair him up with someone else that's uh, on a on a national sure. level trying to do some stuff. So you know, trying to take some smart people, put them together, and uh, you know, work out some stuff at least as a starting point for some of that training. You'd think that some of the modern educational architecture and online training and this sort of thing would fit right in here in terms of putting together a, a protocol and a procedure that, that would so. work. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Kind of copying is, is what Is that we, what you're working on, Chuck? Is, uh, is some of these courses going to be uh, some online courses or in person? How is that split? Um, it'll be, it'll be a, dig a digital platform, but it won't necessarily be online as of yet. We haven't gotten to the point or at least uh, I haven't heard that that's the, the direction that we're going. It's going to be more like an application-based platform yeah. where yeah. you you have the software. The software will probably be free, and then you just purchase the mods as an application. Yeah. So I think each the, mod would be, you know, whatever it would be, the price of a anywhere from 5 to $10, and you just download it and you study it on your phone. It's like you would um, the ham radio test is, is similar to sure, that. Sure. Uh, but I think a, a blend of training, too. Um, the Navy had kind of went off the deep end with some of their training. We used to have all A schools and C schools, and everybody went to school, and then they decided, hey, we'll do computer-based training, CBTs. So then they started throwing people disks and having them just click through stuff and get through these CBTs. But that what you found is that people really didn't have some of the practical application knowledge anymore because they didn't go to the schools where they were hands-on. So, you know, maybe a bit of a blend. Uh, so you learned the book learning part, but I'm not just, practical. Yeah, from the, yeah, exactly. So the Navy kind of went back the other direction a little bit, and they thought they went a little too far in that computer-based training because, like I said, all they were doing was handing the stuff out, get through the course, click, 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 uh, answers, you know, 
the tests and off you went, but it didn't mean they really knew anything. So uh, a balanced approach in there with some hands-on instruction, um, or, you know, with an instructor, it may actually round out the edges on, uh, on any type of computer. Which is training. very much like what we do today in part, in part 91 testing yeah. or part 91 training and such. So that sounds, in fact, what that also suggests, this whole discussion is that uh, Course that, courses that are provided that lead to a certification, an airman certification for a UAS uh, repairman's or maintenance, whatever it might be, those courses themselves are going to have to be certificated or authorized or approved by the FAA, my guess. So at, at that, some level, probably. Yeah. It depends on. Uh, just, you know, like, just like we do today in Part 91. Yeah. Right. But maybe maybe it's just going to be aircraft that are 55 pounds and above at some point. Sure, we categorize it, right? Like, so that might yeah. be, yeah. yeah. But I think uh, the sooner we can understand what that requirement is, the better. And I wonder if the FAA has published anything on that yet. I haven't seen anything no. on it at all. So uh, one aspect of the, we discussed here, one aspect of where this potential future business is, which is the training and the, and the preparation for operations of UAS. Uh, maintenance and repair. Have you thought about that in terms of an aspect of business here? I know that that's one of the aspects that we're, we're doing and we're kind of been heavily into. It's been kind of in the need and demand. Um, a lot of manufacturers, and Chuck, you're, you know this, uh, I'm sure some of the stuff you've done, you know, you, you end up having to send it back to them and waiting forever to get your product back. Um, you know, we saw a, a need to be more expedient, so we've taken on some level of um, uh, repairs and some basic replacement uh, that we can and then things that we have to send back to the factory we do or other times we just tell people just throw it in the trash <laughs> so you know salt water immersed drones so Michael Moto will come and empty the trash right? trash you know just get rid of it so uh, but just the expediency in a local community like here in Hawaii uh, getting people back in the air quickly and stuff and satisfying that need has kind of been a, uh, a piece of our business that's kind of worked out well that's good so in that case you're more than likely going to have to deal with uh, uh, the more complicated, more complex the systems become, the more precise their maintenance and inspection manuals are going to be. So there's probably going to be some level of yeah. factory training here that has to go on. To well, you can. You, you can get various factory training from the different manufacturers. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, they, there's no usually defined uh, heavy-duty maintenance manual. It's kind of a some basic common sense uh, It's basically replacement. Is it not replacement of motors on, on and things, and piece yeah. of structure, yeah. whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah. And uh, so we're looking more at, at R and R, remove and replace, than we are uh, with actual diagnosis and and repair of pieces well, at the subcomponent usually level. Usually more expedient and cost efficient. Right. Yeah. Throw the GPS yeah. out, cut it up so nobody can use it again, and stick a new one in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's good. It's but like fifteen dollars. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Fifteen dollars. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Well, the, whole, the whole UAV yeah. costs 100 so. Oh, yeah. you know, we do that, too. Like I said, when people bring us stuff for repairs, we, we well, hey, here's what it's going to cost for all the parts. Do you know you can buy a new one for another $200? <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, we, we let them know that up front and stuff uh, so they're not wasting money. Do uh, DJI or the other manufacturers provide any kind of a repair service that you can actually send stuff in? And they'll oh, they do. They, yeah, they, they all do. Yeah, obviously, they realize that for them to stay in business, that they have to be very proactive in maintaining their product and, uh, and the, uh, the quality of their product and repairs. And some are covered under warranty, uh, some hmm. that are uh, operator owner induced, maybe not. So it just depends. So, some kind of a Combination, uh, remove and replace, uh, some form of repair, uh, light structural repair where you have just an obvious well, broken structure. Well, we see it more of a service that. life cycle, Chuck, and I think you would agree too, and just like any product, you know, it's a bit of a service life cycle maybe. Is that something you talk about in some of your coursework? Uh, a little bit. Um, you know, for, for our flight training, we actually use DJI stuff, and we do mention, you know, about battery management as being a huge one. Um, you know, if you don't take care of your batteries well, if you don't store them well, if you run them down below 20%, it's going to hinder the life of the battery. So that's something that we definitely go over in, in our training. Um, we also talk about, uh, you know, just overall maintenance in terms of, you know, just checking the physical, uh, you know, structural, you know, copters vibrate a lot. So you want to check your screws and make sure that everything is, is, is fast as far as that goes, because a lot of the problems that do occur during flight is because of a mechanical failure. Um, and then of course, uh, DJI is, you know, really good about making sure that you have your proper upgrades when you power up and so on and so forth. But a lot of the stuff that we, 
fabricate is all the box stuff. Okay. So yeah. we're, we're maintaining all of our stuff on our own as well. So part of this business model then is to retaining a local supply of spare motors, spare pieces of structure, GPS boards, and this sort of thing to a right. certain extent, so you can get guys going quick again. And for us, we're expanding that. I mean, we you know we uh, uh, we look at inventory as money. Inventory is money, and things that aren't going to move very fast. Obviously, we'll keep little or maybe none of, but we know where to get them. Uh, things that are fast movers, uh, you know, we're going to keep more of that on hand. And we continually reevaluate that in our business so that, uh, like I said, when, every time I look at inventory, I just see cash sitting there. It's, <laughs> it's not doing anything for Your me. Your cash so, sitting yeah. there. Right. So, you know, we just got to keep things moving, and, but keep things in stock that uh, kind of meet customer demand. Yeah. So this is pretty exciting, having this discussion. Can you imagine, Chuck, in a year ago or even two years ago, even having the thoughts that go into this conversation? This is a pretty interesting thing to be talking about the specifics of a sustainable business here in the UAS business, and 2016 is going to be the year this all happens. Well, I'm, I'm, man, I made that decision. I'm leaving my yep. job. Uh, wow. You said it right here on the show, right? Fourth, fourth this, is, March. This, is, this is no uh, no, re no return, right? This That's is the right. point of no return. Already, You're done. Fourth of March, I'm out. Okay. And, uh, so we need to put on the <laughs> monitor how people can get a hold of you so that you don't that works. have a, a, a fallback <laughs> problem of some kind here. Exactly. We'll do that after we come yeah. back from our Thanks. break. Thanks. Okay, next break. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Business in Hawaii is a program that is positive stories about business in Hawaii. Uh, we're tired of hearing the negativity and why it's the wrong place to have a business. We talk about the positive reasons for having a business in Hawaii and, and how to be successful. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope that you will tune in and watch the show. It is inspiring and uplifting and educational also. We talk with artists of all different ilk. We talk with them about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, most dear to my heart, why they do it. And it, it never ceases to be fascinating when you get the answer to that question. I hope you'll join us on Center Stage, 2 o'clock Wednesday afternoons. Aloha. Friday night, folks. Friday it used to be Friday afternoon, now it's turned into Friday night. Uh, Ted Ralston here, uh, where the drone leads at Think Tech Hawaii with our guests, uh, Chuck Devaney and Sunny and Cole of Washington, D.C. And Mike Elliott sitting here next to me from sunny and warm Mililani. Mike, no, well, I, I'm an Thanks. IA. I, I, I don't live that far out. Okay, I don't, yeah. I don't have that <laughs> you can walk over here to the show. <laughs> and this is our last segment, our final segment of uh, this show, talking about what the future of droneism is, okay. drone business in, in Hawaii and D.C. and places in between. And we're talking about uh, a lot uh, manufacturing, talking about replacement, talking about uh, maintenance and such to act as the, that, the service part of a, a business. But the analytical side of the business, the, the pr production of analytic products that are useful to uh, the, the That's something I think Chuck is more familiar with a lot of work he's done and I think he could talk to that a lot better. Yeah. Chuck, let's hear about that. In fact, you came back from Bogota and haven't told us about that yet, right? Um, actually, it didn't happen, Ted. Oh, well, that's why you didn't tell us about it. Yeah, um, okay. I, had a, I ran into a lot of problems with uh, just getting into the country because of uh, uh, the yellow fever shortage. So there was a big outbreak in Africa. Apparently, it wasn't very well publicized, but it was enough to put such a damper on the availability of the yellow fever shot um, that uh, I uh, basically just had to cancel it. And I'm still on a waiting list to get a yellow fever shot. Okay, well, we hope you get that shot soon. Since it's snowing and nobody's going to be in business Monday or Tuesday, you can go out to the vet and get a shot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's only four manufacturers globally of that ah. vaccine. Okay, so anyway, this, that's another issue here, though, is that the universal distribution of, of drones is going, to be, is going to require this kind of international travel and such in areas that you might not have experienced before. So well, Even for us here locally, well, I say locally, um, you know, we have jobs now on, on just about every island. We've even been called about doing some stuff over on, uh, you know, Molokai, too. So, you know, it is starting to expand out, and, you know, we do have a lot of people that have been uh, contacting us uh, about some different things uh, from Australia uh, and some of the other Polynesian islands uh, throughout the Pacific. So, you know, we're starting to see that uh, spread and that uh, understanding and use. One of the things that came up uh, was uh, in uh, Micronesia being able to do um, 
use UAVs in some type of fashion to uh, look for uh, fishing encroachment from Chinese fishing vessels in their waters and stuff. Since they didn't have a number of manned aircraft or helicopters available, they thought they could use uh, unmanned aerial systems at altitude to find these guys and then send a boat out to, um, to intercept them and stuff, which I thought was a, was a great utilization of that technology. Cool. So let's look back on the subject of the analytical products and such. Uh, we were trying to defer to Chuck and have Chuck lead us through what's going on. Let, let me just lead that with one observation. I was working with uh, the SNI guys in Boston about two weeks ago, and Chuck, can't believe this, but uh, the platoon level optimization of the next up from the instant IU scene, which is, is one little bit larger that does the platoon level stuff, actually in the foxhole creates the photo mosaic of a, a 1,000 uh, meter radius uh, circle around the site, around the location, uh, 20 minutes after the thing comes back. So the airplane comes back, pull the, CD, the SD card out, stick it in the foxhole, hardened uh, laptop in the rain and the dirt, and produce the, the fully uh, geo-reconciled, rectified uh, map, sub-map, and then that gets deposited on the main map that intelligence provided. So right now, in 20 minutes, you got a complete update of your local situation. Now, two years ago, uh, Chuck, that was you and, and your PhD peers doing that stuff in the laboratory. Now it's being done in the foxhole, in the dirt, and in the rain. That's incredible. How do you it's, see that even being more distributed to, to people at the, at the leading edge, the front edge of, of operations? Um, look at look into uh, uh, well, Qualcomm is doing a lot of work in that with their Snapdragon autopilot. So they're using odometry, so stereo modeling um, in real time, uh, coupled with um, a, a downward facing optical flow sensor. So you've got two cameras out front, and you got one. Um, facing downwards. So in real time, that is developing a three-dimensional model of their environment, not so much for the mapping aspect, but for uh, collision avoidance, obstacle avoidance, which is a big thing. And it's not anything that we've been talking a whole bunch about in the past um, few shows, but that's obviously going to be a huge factor as we bring in these unmanned systems into national airspace. It's going to be optical. Uh, object avoidance, collision avoidance. But the, you so, mentioned that isn't being done for mapping, but it could be done for mapping inside a mine shaft or something like that. Or uh, absolutely, absolutely. So you send this drone in, uh, you know, autonomously, or you introduce it to a room. It um, immediately starts learning its environment and mapping it in real time. Yeah, and this uh, is, I think this we've is, even seen that in the movies. There have been a few movies like that where they've shown some autonomous type uh, vehicles that um, you know just went off, and you could see them using basically a laser to kind of scan everything, but they you know avoided and then just mapped everything out. Uh, you know, so I think that's where yes, exactly. Some of this is maybe heading in the future. We saw some of that uh, a couple weeks ago in Boston at uh, at Insta and I. They were using the, the grid pattern in the in the carpet in the office, and the, the thing was determining rate of change and rate of expansion of the, of the image and such and determining whether it's advancing or moving away from a target and doing its own navigation decisions in the hallway of the office using the carpet as its frame of reference. Now, that, that's, a, that's a learning activity going on there as well. So again, two years ago, this wouldn't even been thought of. Now it's being almost operational. So uh, where is it going next, Chuck? This is, this is an incredible development on its own. Um, well, we're going to have to be able to see in the dark, and <laughs> yeah. we, okay. um, can't, we can't do that using odometry. Um, we can't use that. We can use it using lasers, but the problem with lasers is that uh, of the radiometric effect. Um, rainfall, snowfall, um, yeah. it, it all affects uh, how a laser is going to behave in the return. So you're not going to get, a, you know, you can get a lot of false positives, so on and so forth. And so you're going to have to come up with some sort of way to fuse all of these sensors in real time. You're going to need to be able to see in the dark. You're going to need to be able to see in the rain. So how are you going to be able to see in the dark? Well, yeah, maybe right. radar will work, yeah. but radar is heavily affected by temperature. Yeah. So are you going to have some sort of temp temperature calibration mechanism that's going to be able to work in real time in multiple different environments? So sensor fusion is going to be the next thing. So this is one of the things that can be entering our STEM programs, the identification of what these kind of problems are so the young right. kids can get a, pay attention to them and start thinking about them. Right. So they, they yeah, exactly, you identify a, 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 uh, an activity, they have to solve that problem. They've got to get from point A to, you know, X somewhere, and then there's pieces that are available, but then there's ones that aren't. And they, 
they build those pieces. I mean, a thermal camera is one of my partners with uh, IR Distro builds thermal cameras that weigh about five ounces, and some of those are even getting smaller and smarter, uh, you know, to where you could probably uh, put those on a system where you could use it for, you know, uh, obviously night flight, like uh, people use with FPV type capability here, and so that could be done probably in the very near future once you can fly UAS systems at night. You know, there's a whole other side of this. I brought this along for our, our yeah. touchy feely here for the show. Mike, you recognize this. Yeah. Chuck, you recognize this, right? Are those yours, Ted? They're mine, Chuck. Actually, I'm a, I'm a card-holding member of the Fat Shark Club, and uh, what this is all about cognition. This, is, yeah. this information we're speaking of still has to be presented to the human in such a way that the human can extract something out of it and make a decision. And I've been incredibly impressed by uh, what this has done. We, Chuck, what we've done is we've, you, we use this to, pull, to look at the, at the video down from the instant eye. What the guys have concluded is they can run the bird from a safe rear area and have everybody forward have goggles. And at the right time, hey, boss, take a look and see, is that the right picture? Yep, that's it. Or yeah. move the bird a thousand yards, whatever it might be. But this provides an incredible capability to the guy out front who can then see the picture without having to yeah. fly the airplane. Well, there's, there's collaborative technology, and then there's also technology like this in helping folks that are uh, possibly handicapped, uh, elderly handicapped. Yeah. You know, being able to enjoy things maybe that are in nature, um, you know, whale watching, for example. You know, could you imagine, you know, you've seen a lot of videos, uh, aerials and stuff for whales, uh, but that uh, where people could actually experience that, that are elderly, that maybe are wheelchair bound, maybe, you know, and could actually still be on a whale watching tour, but, you know, be able to see what everyone else is seeing. And these things we're talking about here basically apply to robotics in general. That is uh, uh, self-parking cars, self-driving cars, machines in the, in the assembly line maybe even medical procedures and such, all will benefit from these things we're speaking of in the centrifusion. And I'll put a shout out to uh, uh, Dilmarat Asimov and the guys down at UH who are doing a, some more research with, uh, on that very subject of unstructured data fusion from whatever the sensors might be, colonize, filter it, pull it together, de you know, deconflict it and, and put truth on it, and now you have the picture that you're dealing with, which is useful for guiding the mission as well as determining uh, the avoidance maneuvers and this sort of thing for a potential uh, for a safety issue. So that whole world of uh, information extraction, I mentioned ocean right down the street, incredibly powerful in that particular domain. And we had, as I said earlier, it was used in the Rose Parade this year in the Rose Bowl already. And uh, so the world's moving fast in this direction of uh, what to do with the information we collect. And you guys are both at the forefront of it, which is the incredible part. And I really applaud you, and uh, Mike, in the, in the business you're in, pushing forward in, in this case, smiling at all the regulations and just complying, going forward. No, no sense fighting them, no, right? That's, that's all you can do. It uh, also provide, you know, useful feedback. Um, you know, yep. the folks that are making the rules and regulations aren't usually the ones that are out there operating. So, uh, you know, useful feedback to them, I think, is always uh, poignant. It, it's a, when it's appropriate, and, um, and anyone that's in the industry should, uh, you know, comment and provide feedback so they can, you know, make succinct regulations and, and that work for uh, commercial operations and don't impinge upon hobbyists either. I think the other thing you're showing us is that this whole world of UAS is a universal world. It doesn't have any particular geographic boundaries. The fact that Oahu is isolated makes no difference. You're just working just fine. And yeah. Chuck, as an example, is on the other end of that and can help feed us, and we can help feed Chuck. Well, and our future, what we look to do is obviously, you know, that sales service repair piece, but we want to get, be able to do manufacturing. You've got to make some money at this, right, Well, at the manufacturing, end of the yeah. programming, and uh, there's no reason that the state of Hawaii can't be the Kitty Hawk of the Pacific in this century for drones and UAS systems. There's, there's no reason at all. And Chuck, we'll so, consider you part of the state of Hawaii still, even though you're apparently in a different uh, time code and area code right now. So as we uh, close out our, our, uh, our last segment of the show here, this has been, as usual, an incredible uh, uh, trip for me going through these things and discussions of what we've, what we've come up with. Uh, Chuck, uh, let us know what your final thoughts are that you'd like people to take away from watching this episode from your newly inspired East Coast perspective. Um, we're all on the same team. Um, we're all kind of trying to, you know, figure out a way to make this industry sustainable. So I know that we've had a lot of discussions on how to do that, but I think as, as long as we all maintain uh, our roles as being stewards of the industry, I think that there's definitely going to be a way for all of us to overcome a lot of these obstacles that we still need to, to, to overcome. Um, 
And uh, yeah, just keep learning, keep moving forward, and uh, keep your chin up. Okay. Can do. Mike, your your thoughts? Well, you know, it, uh, I think Chuck hit on part of that too. It's this this collaborative effort too. The people that are within the industry, uh, that uh, you know, sharing and friendship and of, of uh, knowledge and support of one another, and trying to bring everything together. One of the guys that uh, flies for me regularly, uh, Jonas Saul, has got a his new sky perspectives. They're going to be out filming the Volcom. They did Pipeline Masters here, you know, and they were doing live drone video on TV. And people didn't realize that necessarily and stuff. But they were streaming live from the drone on, on, on live TV and on their uh, uh, website over the World Surf League. So, you know, there's there's a whole new arena there that um, has opened up for this type of technology. That's great. And this, as we spoke last week on the show with Bruce Parks, we talked about the 2016 event, the drone racing competition here on Oahu. Let's talk at a future time, as soon as we can get it together, about the STEM aspects of that and how, sure. how that STEM and the training and the opportunity for people to touch the technology. I think we could bring uh, George Purdy and uh, Isla on for that, that yep. show. And Chuck. Okay. And Chuck, yeah. So everybody, thanks very much. Mike, once again, thanks. Thanks. Chuck, see you later, man. Thanks a lot Take for care. coming on the show. Stay we'll warm. Get some, uh, keep staying warm in the snow, and then we'll see you all at a future time here. And folks, uh, have a nice weekend.